culture. I'm now talking about law, and um, it's a particularly important subject. I will talk quite slowly, so I hope that most of you can understand roughly what I am said, and some PowerPoint, some titles there. It's particularly important right at this very moment, because, as you know, Xi Jinping and the Central Party have introduced a number of very important law reforms just in the last few weeks. And the future of China will depend very much on the success of these reforms. Why is law so important? Law is important because it, as I say here, it underpins the confidence and the freedom of citizens and ensures their allegiance to the state. It makes people, if I'm here, I'll use this. Right, thank you. It makes people feel free that they control their own destinies and can move freely. So, in many ways, we in the West consider that the rule of law is the basis of freedom and democracy. Without the rule of law, you cannot have these desirable things. And it is clear that Xi Jinping and your fellow rulers have realized that only if you have an effective legal system can the people's sense of well-being and of being part of this great nation of China be fulfilled. It leads to some problems which I'll talk about later, but the idea of basing your political and social system on the rule of law is something which we in but have found very important. The second reason why the rule of law is so important is that it makes advanced economic and social life possible. Shenzhen was founded, as you know, it's just been the anniversary, the 30th anniversary, and it was founded on basically on a legal basis, that is the Shenzhen Free Economic Zone, which was an experiment which Deng Xiaoping then um, made to spread across much of China. And it is a legal concept, freedom to transact in the economic sphere. And the greatest of um, economists, my fellow Scotsman Adam Smith, in his Wealth of Nations, really in a lecture he gave when he was a young man, he said that if you want to be wealthy, you need three things. You need peace, a good taxation system, and a due administration of justice. If you have those things, you can have very successful economic growth. And Shenzhen is a very good illustration of what he was talking about. The laws are the rules by which we act. All of life can be looked on as a game, a game not dissimilar from football or 
basketball or any other game. And in all games, including social games we play as human beings, and in economic games, you need rules. And people know, need to know what the rules are. And also that if they or someone else breaks these rules, they will be punished. The economic life obviously cannot proceed if every time you enter into a contract or bargain, the other person, you're not sure that the other person will follow this through, abide by it. So you need a legal system of civil law to ensure that. And for your good behavior, you also need to know that other people know what the laws are and about, abide by them. So those are some of the reasons why you need a strong and reasonable legal system. Your task here in China in introducing the rule of law is immense. I know of no other case where there has been such rapid economic and social growth combined with a complete absence, until very recently, of law. Law, as I say, in the modern sense, hardly existed in China until about the time that Shenzhen started to take off. For several thousand years, China's, China more or less ruled through moral principles and not through legal forces. There were no lawyers trained, there were very few courts, there was no developed legal system. Law was carried out very simply, often with the use of quite severe punishments, the use of torture. So there was no independent legal profession, legal training, And that, that situation, which continued right up through the Qing and then the New Republic, was made even more anti-law, as it were, by the period of the Communist Party and Chairman Mao. As you know, Chairman Mao, at the beginning, introduced some legal um, ideas, and then later, law was more or less destroyed, abolished, the courts, the legal training disappeared. So by 1979, when Shenzhen started, there was no legal system really in China at all. So in the last 30 years, you have had to introduce for the first time a new kind of legal system. It's a, an immense task you're facing. The reforms from about 1980 start from about 1980, but in fact it's only in the last 10 or so years that serious reforms were initiated. My wife and I came to China seriously to study uh, some 12 years ago, and at that time the legal uh, forms were still very underdeveloped. So we are really talking about the last 10 or 12 years when a great deal has been done. And this is the background to the current interest and widespread discussion and the pronouncements. People often use the sentence, the rule of law, and most people don't know what it means. Most people think that what the rule of law means is obeying the law, being ruled by law. If you ask someone in England or America what is the rule of law, they'd say, well, being a law-abiding citizen is the rule of law. 
In fact, that is not the meaning of the rule of law. The rule of law is, perhaps if I um, give you the Chinese translation, it will be easier for you to follow it. The rule of law was an idea specified and defined by a great English lawyer in a book called The Law of the Constitution, A. V. Dicey. And he said, and I'll read it out and you can follow it here, the rule of law means in the first place the absolute supremacy or predominance of regular law as opposed to the influence of arbitrary power and excludes the existence of arbitrariness of prerogative or even of wide discretionary authority on the part of the government. It means again equality before the law or the equal subjection of all classes to the ordinary law of the land administered by the ordinary courts. And lastly, that in short, the principles of private law have with us been, by the action of the courts and parliament, so extended as to determine the position of the crown and of its servants. Thus, the Constitution is the result of the ordinary law of the land. So basically, the rule of law is about the relation between politics, between power, and the rules, law. It's not about being uh, a, a law-abiding citizen. It's about <coughs> splitting politics and power from the legal system. This is why you are living in such a critical moment. Because for the political system of your leaders, inherited from the communist era, for them to give away some of their power to the legal system is extremely difficult and very unusual, as I'll mention later. So, it, the rule of law is defined in that way. How do you establish the rule of law? The tendency in almost all societies through history has been in the other direction towards a rule of law, but to rule without law, inequality before the law, and the rulers above the law. If you look at, for example, the history of my continent, Europe, and you look at what happened in France, Italy, Spain, Germany, again and again, the legal system were destroyed. Um, Louis XIV in France, or Napoleon, um, or in the 20th century, the fascist regimes destroyed the rule of law. And the Soviet Union, Stalin, and so on, did the same thing, or Pol Pot in Cambodia. So when rulers become powerful, they want to get rid of the law. So the movement towards a rule of law is very unusual and very difficult. So in this talk I want to just give you a set of key mechanisms or tools to establish the rule of law. I think if a country or a nation like China 
could institute almost all of the tools which I am going to present to you as a set of tools and make them effective, then you would have a country which had the true rule of law and you would have a country that is truly democratic. I feel in a position to talk to you about this because my own country, England, is where the rule of law was invented and continued. It has a great legal tradition. Law is the most important part of English civilization. It is the bedrock of our society. We devote a huge amount of attention to law. And as a historian of my own culture, and as an anthropologist looking at my own country from other countries like Japan or China, I can see how important and central law is. So over a period of 800 years, we developed a working, effective system of the rule of law, starting effectively some 800 years ago, which is about the same time as the birth of my own University of Cambridge. So here are a few of the features of the laws in England. Some you will know well and some you may not have thought of. The first is that law is different from custom. Law is uniform. Take the case of China, you have the same law, or you would have the same law in mainland China, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, in all the different parts of China. But custom, that is what governs much of ordinary behavior, for example, marriages, or the way in which people inherit wealth from their parents. Custom is different from law. This has been a very, very important distinction in English history, and it's one which I think the Chinese would find extremely useful. I know there is already a distinction in Chinese civilization, but I think it could be built up further. It was the basis, for example, of the largest empire that the world has ever known, or will ever know, which is the British Empire. Because we had one unified law which covered Britain, India, Australia, Canada, and so on. But the customs within these countries were enormously varied. So the customs of how you married, how you ate, what you worshipped, what you wore, and much of the local family law was varied from country to country. And if you built on that idea in China, it would resolve some of the problems you now have with some of the places on the edge of China. You do already, of course, do that with Hong Kong, one country, two systems. And that, in a way, is what I'm talking about. The second feature, a second feature to stress, is that law is different from justice. This may surprise some of you, but the English long ago realized that you can have a set of laws, but they don't cover much of life. You can me never make laws to cover everything. And also, many of the laws may turn out, in practice, not to be fair or just. So, in England, we developed, alongside the ordinary law, the common law, a system of fairness, 
which has another name in English, equity. And we had big and important courts which tried to support fairness and equity. For example, if you were a woman, and in English law you had some discrimination against women, you might under the law be treated unfairly, but you could go to these courts and they would say, well, this is not fair. Just because you're a woman, you should be treated equally. Or if you were a child, or if you were poor, or if you were an old person, or if you had lost all your documents. So we had a whole system which put an emphasis on fairness and justice. Because we believe that the real aim of all this is not written laws and abiding by laws, but fairness. This is a big problem for China because your legal system has developed considerably out of a bureaucratic administrative system. So much of your time is spent on seeing whether people have followed the administrative principles and we don't consider this to be much to do with justice. A fundamental principle of English law is that it must be equal. This is based on a concept which is not totally, does not totally fit with traditional Chinese thought. Confucian, Confucianism, the major philosophy, does not treat people as equal. It treats the father as superior to the child, the elder brother to the younger brother, men superior to women. So it is based on unequal statuses. But modern law in our country, and increasingly in yours, is based on the idea that men and women, poor and rich, high status and low status, government employees and ordinary people, parents and children, are all equal before the law. This is a real revolution in thinking. And again, it is quite recent in China. In the uh, period of Chairman Mao, for instance, people were not treated as equal. For example, if you had if you were wealthy, you were a wealthy farmer, then you would be purged as um, a right-wing and uh, landlord. If you had certain ideas, you were a rightist, and so on. So people were not treated as equal. But in fact, of course, as I said, there was not much of a legal system anyway. Now you are moving towards a world of equality and your, in your constitution you explicitly state that all citizens of China are equal, men and women, old and young and so on. But it is quite difficult to follow this through. There is a strong temptation for the judges to, for example, if you have a dispute between an older relative, an uncle and a nephew, to say, well, the uncle is in a superior position and should be treated differently. But modern Western law is very individualistic. It believes that everyone has rights. Children have rights. Women have rights. Everyone has rights. And related to this is the idea that no one is above the law. In our uh, society in England, we have a royal family, a king and queen, and not, and not a king at the moment, but a queen and um, the princes and other members of the royal family. They are all subject to the same law as I am. 
I used to lecture in Cambridge University and among my students were members of the royal family who came to Cambridge to study. And if one of them <coughs> had caused a trouble in my lecture, I'd have said, get out. Uh, or if the Queen happened to be driving her car and uh, went through a red traffic light, she would have to go to court and be punished. So everyone is subject to the same laws including the Prime Minister and everyone else. This has been established again and again in English law. And the extreme case was when we believed, and the lawyers believed, that our king was misbehaving, King Charles I. And so he was tried in an English court, found guilty of illegal behaviour, and his head was cut off. This is very, very difficult for political authorities to accept. But it's clear that your present government is attempting very hard to bring this idea about. Some of your most powerful and senior people are being brought to account and tried for corruption and other offences. So there is great hope that you are beginning to bring everyone. This is terribly important because otherwise an ordinary citizen can be put into all sorts of difficulties because an administrator or a bureaucrat or a party official says, I am above the law. The law must be uniform in time and space. The law must extend in the same way to the furthest corners of the nation and there can be no privileged or exempted areas. This is very similar to your language in China. Mandarin is extends all over China and in the English system there were no areas of England although it was a small country or the British Empire, which was huge, where there were privileged or areas where the law did not apply. The next idea is that law must be made by the people. Now, this is a real puzzle for China. Remember, I'm talking about a country which developed this system which in its great period of lawmaking only consisted of half the population of Shenzhen. Five million people or less, half of Shenzhen. And in that situation, of course, you can have a parliamentary political system where you can really feel that your vote counts and that the people who you send to decide your country's affairs are chosen by you and therefore you participate in their decision as to what laws there should be. Of course, all of this is very recent. Uh, until less than a hundred years ago, women were not allowed to vote in England. 100 years or 150 years ago, only the rich could vote. So we were not a true democracy until very recently. And in many ways, America was only a true democracy to a certain extent about 50 years ago because the blacks in South Southern states were not free. But we do believe that our laws are made by the people. This is partly because we have, our laws are largely made by the judges. We have a system based not on decrees from a central authority, but in a case it is decided in a certain way. And then that case acts as a model or precedent in the future. 
So the laws evolve and grow and are made by ordinary judges and by our parliament. The next premise is that people are to be trusted, that they are honest and mainly behave legally. They are innocent until proved guilty and they are presumed to be willing to tell the truth when they are put under oath. This is a very strange set of assumptions which we have in England, which is that on the whole, when you meet someone and they tell you something, they will tell you the truth. And that on the whole, people will behave legally. That means you don't have to constantly watch them. You don't have to constantly punish them. And you can assume that they are innocent, that is, that they are not guilty of a crime, until finally they prove to be. Now in China you have the beginnings of this idea. You have the idea that until you are proven in a court to be guilty, you are not yet guilty. We have this in a slightly stronger form in England, that you are presumed to be innocent start off with the presumption that you have not committed the crime, but someone has to make a big effort to prove that you have. There are different kinds of offences and there should be different levels of court which deal with the offences of different kinds. In England, um, we have four levels, um, a, a local level, the magistrates, courts, which my wife Sarah was a judge in uh, those kinds of courts. Then you have county courts and then you have all the sizes and then central courts and then the supreme court. In China also you have four levels of court. My feeling, thinking about it, is that you probably need a fifth level in China. You have such a huge country, 20 times the size of the United Kingdom, and to deal with it only four levels is probably means that the, the lower level courts are too big. You need more localized courts. So you really need to have your supreme court and then down to quite a localised court. And this is an idea which I think will probably be developed in the future. The next idea is that people are presumed to be reasonable in their behaviour and motivation. And the standard on which they are judged is what is called the reasonable man. That is to say that we assume that people most of the time will do sensible, rational, reasonable things. They will take care. They will be aware of other people. They will um, drive carefully, um, make sure that they don't uh, attack someone, and so on. And so this idea that human beings are reasonable, rational, is the basis of our legal system. And it is the basis of much of our law. So when in an English court you are uh, asking questions of someone who is accused of some offence, you will ask questions which try to work out whether that person is lying or telling the truth. And the model or idea you use is, is this person, when they say they did this, were they acting reasonably? So, for example, if a driver um, is, says, well, I'd been to a pub and I got, I'd been drinking a lot of uh, wine and then I got into my car and I drove along and then I hit someone. It's, and then they deny, they say, well, 
Actually, I went to the pub, but I didn't drink anything. I just sat in the corner. And I didn't drink anything. Now, is that reasonable behaviour? Is it reasonable for someone to spend two hours in a, in a hotel uh, which is serving drink and not to drink anything? So you use the concept of the reasonable man in cross-questioning. Justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done. And this means that all trials should be open to the public and be able to be publicly reported so that people can see that there is no bias in the court. This is, in fact, I understand, something which is spreading in China and is quite widespread. The famous recent cases, of course, of Bo Lai, whose trial was um, shown on television, made Chongqing famous for a while. Um, and uh, I gather that in China now, most trials are in public unless children are involved or some particular reason. It's very, very important that anyone can walk into a court of law and hear the case. Also, that people who are accused should be able to assert their innocence. Even when the court tells you that you are guilty, in English law you can still go on saying, no, no, I'm not guilty. The problem in many legal systems, and this applied in France, Italy, Spain, uh, as well as the Soviet Union and China, was that before you could actually convict someone, that is to say they are definitely guilty, you needed them to confess, to say, I am guilty. And if they would not confess, you had to torture them. So the basis for torture in China, um, Stalin's Russia, France, and so on, was this idea that you must confess before the court can sentence you. We in England, except for a very short period, with some cases, have said that torture is not allowable in any circumstance in English law. Neither is it allowable within England, nor if people are tortured in other countries, and you have the evidence from that torturer, you cannot use it in an English court case. And this is a very important principle which I, I think the Chinese are adopting too. People should be free from our fear of arbitrary arrest. And that means that basically, if you are arrested, we very early on had something, a defense called habeas corpus. That's Latin for I have a body. It meant that within a very short period of time, 24 hours, 48 hours, you have to be charged, accused of something, and have access to a lawyer to defend you. Now, you half have this in China. You have a situation here where um, you can be imprisoned and held there for some time, more than 24 hours. But before you are going to be taken to court, a week before, the court has to tell you what you are accused of and give you, give you the background. In some legal systems, you are never told what it is that you are accused of. That's what makes it very difficult to defend yourself. Individuals should be allowed to form into legally recognized groups. I'll, I'm going into my extra time, so I will go through these more quickly. This is the right to free association, to join together and to form a group which the state recognizes um, and allows. This is very, very important. It's what we call civil society, and it's something that is growing in China but needs to be developed. People should be 
tried by their equals. This is absolutely central to our legal system, that the state here, the citizen is here, and between them there are 12 ordinary citizens who form what we call a jury. And it is this jury of people who are not paid, who are not in the power of the state, they have to decide if someone is guilty or innocent. Now you are beginning to approach this with people's judges in China, but it, there are some significant differences between people's judges and having 12 jury people. Until China has a proper jury system, you will not have the rule of law. It is absolutely essential to develop, but quite difficult. Judges must on the whole be free from any government pressure. They must be come from the people. We had a system of magistrates um, which were just ordinary people who decided they would like to do something for the society. And so they were not formally trained lawyers. And they are terribly important in our legal system. Something like 97% of English cases are first tried by magistrates. And I don't think you yet have such a system. And it would be very, very valuable for you to have such a system. Senior judges must be free of all suspicion of corruption. The way we dealt with this was to pay judges very well. They had so much money that they didn't want any more. And I think there are problems with some of your judges who are still under a lot of pressure and control from political forces. The law is independent of all other institutions, of the government, of the church, of bureaucracy. And that is a central feature of our legal system. The law is largely based on simple negatives. That means, basically we say, you must not do this, you must not do that, you must not do that, otherwise you can do what you like. This is a much better way of making a legal system than trying to work out all the things you must do. If you try and specify all the things you must do, it becomes very bureaucratic, very complicated. The English legal system is like the English system of games. We invented most of the games in the world, like football and cricket and so on. And these are based on just a few negative rules. You can't do this, you can't do that, otherwise you're free. The law is flexible and pragmatic and constantly changing. It can be changed easily. You need a system in China which is such a great and complex civilization that is constantly changing, which allows it to be flexible so that things, injustice does not build up. And to conclude, um, I won't give you this long quotation, though perhaps I'll leave it at the end. But we believe our legal system is the basis of our freedom and democracy and our wealth. And this is from Xi Jinping's favourite philosopher, um, an alumni of my University of Cambridge, Lord Bacon. So I'll bring it, come back to this. It's a legal system that's been taken to America, India and elsewhere, and is very unusual. It's under pressure now in Western societies, and there are pressures to erode and destroy our legal system, which is why we now look to China as a place where our legal system will flourish and that you will become a home for the rule of law and pr protect a system which it took us so much effort and time to build up. And we wish you all success in this effort, which means so much for the happiness and wealth and freedom of the world. Thank you very much.